Vicky Poole started supporting independent tech news directly today. Be like Vicky. Become a DTNS member at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, June 25th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And in Finland, I'm Patrick Beja. And uh, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Sarah Lane is on assignment. That means someone gave her an assignment and it wasn't us, so she couldn't be on the show today. Uh, but she will be back on Thursday. She'll be out tomorrow as well. Um, but we have lots of th- lots of legal stuff. FedEx suing the U.S. government, Australian judge saying you can sue people for letting other people post things on Facebook. We also have a solar car if you have a lot of euros that you can buy. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. T-Mobile will launch its 5G service in Atlanta, Cleveland, Dallas, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and New York City, June 28th. I should say parts of those cities, June 28th, for use with a Samsung Galaxy S10 5G. The S10 5G, however, only supports the millimeter wave spectrum. That's what this 5G service uses. However, the S10 5G will not be compatible with yet-to-be-implemented 5G service from T-Mobile on future low- and mid-band frequencies. So not future compatible. Google is accepting applications from G Suite customers to beta test the ability to mark non-Google files for offline access in Google Drive. Testers can only access the files in Chrome. Telegram added new ways to add contacts in its app. Users can now add nearby users from the contact screen, provided the other user is in proximity and also has the same screen open. And you can now open a chat with someone without having to know their phone number. The app now supports location-based group chats, letting users create local groups that anyone in the area can join. Oh, interesting. Could this be used in uh, protests in some places, maybe? Telegram is very good with that crowd, yeah. Good. Exactly. U.S. House Financial Services Committee Chairwoman Maxine Waters announced the committee will hold a hearing on Facebook's Project Libra on June 17th. The U.S. Senate Banking Committee previously announced a scheduled hearing on the cryptocurrency on July 16th. Did I say June? I meant July. It's both July 16th and 17th. Libra's co-creator, David Marcus, is expected to testify at both hearings. (laughs) And most of what he'll say is, calm down. We haven't built it yet. No, that's not our plan. Calm down. We haven't built it yet. No, that's not our plan. Or some variation on that. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about what is going on between Facebook and France, Patrick. Uh huh. France's Minister of Digital Affairs, Cedric O, that's his actual last name, O. Uh, it's one letter. Uh, he said part Facebook, South Korean. I think one of his parents is South Korean. Maybe that's why. It is possible. I have to admit, I didn't realize that part of his heritage. Uh, anyway, Cedric O said Facebook has agreed to give judges identification data for some French users suspected of hate speech. Facebook has previously given French judges identification information related to violent and terrorist acts when French judges formally requested it. Facebook resisted handing over information uh, related to hate speech violations as it is not compelled to do so under U.S. French legal conventions and worried uh, countries without an independent judiciary system would abuse that privilege. O says Facebook is only doing this for France. Yeah, so this is interesting. Facebook willing to say, all right, in your case, France, we will go ahead and honor your laws, even though we don't have to, even though there's a treaty that protects us from having to do this, and it's not something we do in other countries. Uh, As long as you go out there and make sure everybody knows we're only doing this for France, okay? Turkey, Turkey. China, well, there's no Facebook in China, but Hong Kong, whatever. Uh, we're not doing this anywhere else. Um, that's this, They're calling this the first of its kind, too. Do, do you think that's true? As far as I know, it's true. It seems so. I mean, the, the, the identification information we're talking about is uh, probably IP addresses, uh, which allow... Uh, uh, police organizations to identify the people further, maybe some additional information also. Mm-hmm. Um, as we mentioned, it is it has been done before in cases of terrorist uh, acts, uh, which is, I think, understandable, and most people in the audience, I'm guessing, would agree with these kinds of um, 
of, of disclosures, it, you have to remember in France, hate speech is regulated pretty heavily. Um, it, it is not quite on the level of terrorism, but it is something that we take quite seriously. And so the issues with Facebook's and other social networks, um, immunity for commenters who would spew hate was very deeply felt. Um, so I suspect this was something that was worked on for a while by Cedric O oh and other officials. Nick um, Clegg, uh, the, the, the former deputy prime minister of the UK, is now in charge of this sort of stuff for Facebook. And apparently he and O oh are the ones who hatched all of the details of this. Right. Um, and you know, there are other things that Facebook and the French government are, are doing, like examining the algorithm and stuff like that. But um, uh, my point, which I'm trying to, to um, uh, show is, I suspect uh, mainly American or maybe English or other uh, nationalities listeners might think, wow, this is one step too far. Um, hate speech is taken very seriously around here. And I suspect in Germany, it might be the same thing as well. Yeah, hate speech. I, I know some US listeners particularly will say, well, what is hate speech? How do you decide what it is? That's not fair. Uh, I don't think, I think that's not the point here. Uh, France, uh, as Patrick just explained, uh, is not new to regulating this kind of speech. You may or may not agree with how they regulate it, but that's the law in France. And Facebook is making an extra effort to comply with local law in a democracy without and, eroding the ability to not comply with laws they don't have to in places where they don't feel comfortable doing so. I mean, it is an interesting precedent for other countries, which might say, well, you do it for France. Why don't you do it for other, uh, for us? Um, but it's also important to note that in the case of France, who decides what is hate speech? Judges. It's the mm -hmm. judiciary system that will tell Facebook, we decide, we have decided this comment is hate, is hate speech. Please tell us who said this. So yeah. it's not Facebook deciding themselves. Right. It's it's the it's the similar to getting a warrant, it's having a judge review this and say, yes, okay, mm -hmm. you're justified in asking for this identity. We'll let we'll let it happen. Uh, FedEx has sued the U.S. government Monday, saying it should not be held liable for inadvertently shipping products that violate U.S. restrictions on Chinese companies. Uh, this has happened twice, and China's not happy about it. FedEx returned an attempted shipment of a Huawei P30 phone by a British journalist from PC Mag who was just trying to send it to one of his colleagues in the United States. Uh, FedEx says the denial of shipment was an operational error. Okay. Uh, they got confused with the Huawei name on the package, even though it's not illegal for a British journalist to send his Huawei phone to a, another British or another journalist in the U.S. Uh, a previous package destined for a Huawei address in Asia was misrouted in error by FedEx to the United States. That caused a lot of upset uh, feelings in China. FedEx fears it may, because of these two instances, be added to China's unreliable entities list as a result. That's a, a list that China has created to say if these people are not following our laws, you know, if they're abusing uh, or unreliable in following our practices and procedures, we will block their operation. FedEx doesn't want to lose their operation in China. China's foreign ministry has asked FedEx for a full explanation. They haven't said anything about putting him on an entities list. And FedEx's lawsuit says that export rules, and I quote, essentially deputize FedEx to police the contents of the millions of packages it ships daily, even though doing so is a virtually impossible task logistically, economically, and in many cases, legally. So essentially FedEx saying, look, we're getting in all kinds of trouble trying to apply your rules because we don't want to be held liable. We need to sue the U.S. government to determine that we wouldn't be liable if we make mistakes so that we don't have to keep getting into these problems. This is really interesting in itself. Um, if you allow me to go there already, I think it's even more interesting when you compare this um, policy applied to physical goods to the kind of policies some people would like Facebook to apply to um, digital content. Of course, it's not the same because as Roger mentioned before we started the show, it's not physical things when you're talking about comments on Facebook. But when you read the virtually impossible task logistically, economically, and in many cases legally, yep. I think it applies. And I think a lot of people will look at this and say, well, yes, of course, Facebook, uh, sorry, FedEx can't be expected to do all this. And then you talk about Facebook and they're like, 
Rob at Facebook. Computers. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yes, it, it. We can imagine opening boxes and checking manifests is a lot more difficult. But but in fact, the the number of posts on a social network uh, way outscales the number of packages to the point that it's probably an equally difficult problem. So you have FedEx and Facebook complaining in the same way uh, about how to get that job done. We're not letting either one of them off the hook when we say that. It's just a very interesting comparison, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, similarly, an Australian judge has given Dylan Voller the right to sue media companies over Facebook comments written by readers about him. Let's try to follow me here. Voller uh, had a video shown on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's Four Corners program in July 2016 of him being mistreated in prison. However, Voller has been in and out of juvenile detention. Uh, you know, doesn't have the squeakiest clean uh, background. So there have obviously been other stories about him. And Voller is now suing News Corp, Fairfax Media, which is now nine, and Sky News Australia for defamation. The reason is because users of Facebook made false and possibly defamatory comments on stories about Voller that these news agencies published on Facebook. So they publish a story a user goes to their Facebook page, writes a comment, and Voller is holding the media company responsible for what the user posted. Now, follow the logic here. Justice Stephen Rothman found that the media companies could be considered the publishers of the comments in a legal sense, as the companies could delay reader comments and monitor if they were defamatory before releasing them to the public. Now, Facebook doesn't have a delay function, but... There was testimony from a social media expert named Ryan Shelley that you could put a filter of the 100 most common English words on your posts, and that would hide them so that you could review them before unhiding them. Justice Rothman also said the use of Facebook pages is not about freedom of speech because a Facebook page is meant to promote commercial interests. So the case now moves to an actual defamation trial uh, this was just whether Voller had the right to sue. The media companies were saying, no, he doesn't even have standing to sue. We didn't publish the comments. Uh, but the media companies can also appeal Justice Rothman's decision, which I expect they will. Yeah, it's a weird one. I understand the logic of the decision, uh, except for the part that it all hinges on the uh, possibility for these companies to hack together a moderation uh, uh, filter that seems very unwieldy. Um, I, I think I could see these uh, companies treated as using this for commercial interests, so it's not so much a, a, a need for information issue. Uh, and then they have the possibility of moderating these comments, which they do. That You don't need I mean to go through that hacking thing. But, the, but to, Justice Rothman's decision uh, hinged on the fact that they could have delayed publication because the media companies were saying, well, shoot, uh, you're putting us in the position of having to judge what's defamatory or not from what other people are saying. And and that would mean going and reviewing all these. And Rothman said, well, you could just delay them from being posted. So you only post the ones you're sure about. Right. But they and that still requires a to... hack, which isn't part of Facebook system, which other social media experts said, yeah, that's not really that effective. Right. But I, I I mean, they would need to go and review them, whether it is before or after uh, the their publication. Maybe legally it has a ton of importance and that uh, uh, dictated uh, Justice Rothman's decision. But from my point of view, if they go in and, and review them and delete some of them or hide some of them, they still kind of could be considered to be acting as publishers for those comments. Because so I can see how right? that, yeah, 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 exactly. So I can see how he would come to that decision. I think that moderation thing is is a little bit of a weird part of the whole uh, conversation. But, well, but more importantly, I think he needed it. Uh, if I, if I may, I guess, I think yeah. he needed it because. Uh, without that, then it's more like Facebook. It's more like a safe harbor situation. So he had to show, oh, but you could have stopped them, right? right? Because it, because de with defamation, if you moderate after the fact, you're still liable for the time that it was up. I suppose, but I guess it could have been said that they made a good faith effort to go and moderate them as quickly as they could. Or it, it just seems to me like he's 
he needed that legal argument crutch to make his ruling. But that's just my interpretation. Mm -hmm. Regardless, um, they are being judged now. They are being uh, uh, sued on comments that they didn't themselves uh, uh, post. And that's, I think, the most interesting part of this uh, story. And it opens uh, the door for publications on a Facebook page, which they manage to be responsible for what other people say in comments in general. And I think that is an interesting shift in where we put the responsibility um, for defamatory or otherwise, you know, potentially illegal comments. Uh, usually, I think we would have said, well, it's Facebook's responsibility. Now we're talking about the administrator of the page. Well, yeah, Facebook has safe harbor. They're like, we're not responsible for what people post on our platform. Otherwise, we can't exist as a platform. We will try to moderate it, but we're not responsible for it. Yeah, right? but you know how how much people want them to moderate and Twitter. Well, yes, and, but legally, yeah. they still have shelter mm -hmm. to say, we can't be sued for what somebody else said, right? Right, right. Uh, that, that is quintessential. That's, that's quintessential to Facebook being able to operate. Uh, even if they make good faith efforts to moderate. So you do you do need to have that safe harbor for this platform to exist at all. But what this justice is saying is in the case of somebody operating on Facebook, now they're acting like it's a letter to the editor kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all yeah. right, tell us about LinkedIn. Uh, Axios report Axios. Axios. Mm. I'm sure. not never sure how to read this one. Maybe it's one of the three musketeers. Um, they report that LinkedIn will announce changes to its feed algorithm made over the last 12 months that services professional content according to sources. One change involves elevating a post close to a user's interests that needs engagement rather than promoting a post already going viral. Interesting one. Yeah, uh, there's also uh, uh, more likely to generate co elevating content, more likely to generate comments and reactions based on shared niche interests or proximity of network connection. Uh, the algorithm will also prioritize posts using mentions or hashtags to draw people in. Uh, this is this is interesting uh, because it's LinkedIn saying, "Gosh, just making everybody click and go viral." isn't good user experience. And we just came to that conclusion on our own. There wasn't a big outrage against LinkedIn uh, for this sort of stuff because they're they're a different situation. They're a different content platform. Uh, I'm not saying that this is, you know, the kind of result that could be applied to every other social network out there, but I thought it was significant that a social network came to this conclusion on its own. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting, uh, an interesting one. It might be, as you said, that this is very specific to LinkedIn and that it would work for them and maybe not for others. But it feels like the um, the the common wisdom about algorithm and surfacing uh, um, content you would be interested in was well, we push the thing that is getting reactions already, and the snowball effect is uh, unavoidable. Uh, what they're saying is, actually, if we push content to you that you specifically are interested in, even if they aren't things that have been getting a lot of engagement, then you might have a better experience. Maybe that's something that could be looked at, maybe they're already looking at it, but looked at by you know the likes of Twitter and Facebook. Um, that could be a different approach. Yeah. All right, back in 2013, 2015, and 2017, students from Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands won the Cruiser Class Races in the World Solar Challenge in Australia with their Stella series of solar racing family cars. Uh, that's, that's a class of car in Europe. Doesn't mean families were in the cars while they were racing them. Uh, <laughs> some of those students started a company called Lightyear in 2017 to make a consumer solar car and the first prototype the five-seater Lightyear One has been unveiled with plans to deliver to customers in 2021. The car's roof has five square meters of solar panels that charge the battery up to 12 kilometers of range per hour. It doesn't sound like a lot, but hold on. The battery can go 725 kilometers. It's about 450 miles on a full charge. So it's got big range. The Tesla Model S has a range of 370 miles. And the Lightyear one also supports other regular plug-in charging, 60 kilowatt of fast hour. Uh, that could add 507 kilometers of range per hour. So you don't have to rely on the solar panels to charge. That's supplementary. 
Pre-orders are available now. You have to put a deposit down of 119,000 euros. Not cheap. Uh, the expected starting price is 149,000 euros. The first 100 orders have already been reserved. You can reserve future blocks, but you don't know when they're going to ship. First 100 are expected to ship in 2021. Uh, this is definitely a prototype. This is definitely the first attempt at this. It's way too expensive. Uh, they aren't making a lot of them, but the idea that, you know, uh, I drive to work, I park the car in the, in the parking lot and I don't have to plug it in because over my eight hour work day, uh, 12 kilometers of range per hour is enough to charge me back up to full and let me get home. It's a really interesting, um, approach and it seems like it would make sense, but I've also, read uh, a, a lot of not contradictory opinions but uh, supplemental opinions about mm. does it really make sense it seems like if you don't have charging uh, stations everywhere it is indeed a, a nice bonus but for example the idea that putting uh, solar panels on your roof if you happen to be living in a place where you can do right. that of course um not only allows you to charge that car uh in the, the evening and the night, but also provides electricity for your house. Um, so that is something to take into consideration. Um, it's it's uh, still a, an interesting approach. We recently had to buy a car because my wife is, uh, we live far away from Helsinki. She's driving there a, a few times a, a week. We wanted a hybrid and turned out hybrids are not great for uh, long uh, um, highway trips so that didn't really make sense um really but yeah it, it's they, they were like a the kind of hybrids hybrid? that we can yeah gas or a and plug -in hybrid gas and electric not plug-in because i have a hybrid from 2002 and i use it for long-range trips all the time but that's it that, okay well yeah. i mean it works but you lose the advantage of the hybrid because the battery is tiny so it works a lot better in cities at least the ones we were looking at okay all right um and and this one could be interesting uh also because of the the fact that the range can be uh, uh so good is great in cold countries because mm. you lose uh maybe a quarter or maybe more of the range in cold countries because the temperature affect the batteries right. um and in that sense the fact that you can recharge it um with the the solar panels helps uh, potentially a lot, I'm guessing. Unless so, it's the part of the year where you don't have the sun coming up. Well, you still have a little bit of sun. It's not. Uh, it's not. <laughs> right. You know. But the opposite part of it is that the other part of the year you have a lot of sun, so it mm -hmm. can actually mm -hmm. recharge yeah, during yeah. the night without you plugging it in anywhere. <laughs> probably. Point. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, I feel like this is a lot. A lot of ways a proof of concept, right? Twelve. 12 kilometers of range per hour, I don't think is nothing. I think there are some scenarios where that is practical, but it is certainly not necessary, like you said. Uh, but it's kind of showing, hey, this is what we can do now. Imagine if we keep going and improving uh, what we might be able to add to this. Also, there's some some really interesting efficiencies in the way they built the car, Roger, that I know you noticed. Uh, well, I mean, this car was designed, at least based on the kind of the early specs that we, we can see, it's really designed for maximizing the amount of uh, power you can get, not just the power, but uh, the length of time. I mean, they, they give a stated of a zero to a hundred kilometers, roughly about 10 seconds, which is about zero to 60 in 10 seconds. Not very fast, not even for like another economy car. It's pretty mm -hmm. slow. Um, they use in hub or in wheel motors, which means that the motors for the car are actually in the wheels where the tires uh, are. And that has some benefits in that you can rid yourself of all the mechanical complexity of having a drive shaft and uh, constantly velocity joints and a bunch of stuff. You keep the suspension more simple. The offset is that it makes the ride a little more uh, um, uncomfortable because you're adding un unsprung weight to the tires. So it's definitely a bunch of trade-offs. But, I mean, if they can get it to a decent mileage and get the price lower, it, it definitely could be seen as a... Definitely seen as a viable car. Although I will stress, at this point in time, seems more like a niche car yeah. than an actual like I'm going to replace my everyday commuter mm. car. Yeah, I'm not it, spending 149,000 euros to replace my. And that's 17. That's euros. part of the of the issue, isn't it? Because they have to build it so light that it seems it would drive the price up. Um, they have to drive it light to uh, uh, make it light because of the. Uh, uh, 
issues with batteries and and autonomy um so will they be able to bring the price down enough if those constraints are also there i i don't know it seems like it might be possible but a much simpler solution would probably be to have cars that have better batteries and it seems like the technology is progressing slowly but we're kind of getting there um I don't know. It, it's. It, I wish yeah. it would work. It seems a little bit gimmicky and too much. You know. Other I know. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go so far as call it gimmicky myself. But it is definitely niche, uh, and it mm. is not. It is not the solution, like you say. Yeah, I mean, you nailed it. The better battery tech is what needs to happen to make this accessible to everyone and cheaper, uh, without having to, you know, spend one hundred forty nine thousand euros so that you can make the car light enough that it gets enough range that this matters. Yeah. But or better. Or better solar panel tech, you know, if that gives mm. you a more uh, range per hour. Charge. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And maybe that's where they're going with this is like, this is Possibly. the first round. We'll see. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Big thanks to everyone who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com and join in our Facebook group, Facebook.com slash groups slash DailyTechNewsShow. Before we get out of here today, uh, Patrick, you've been playing around with the iPad OS beta now that it's out for everybody. What do you think so far? Um, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, there are some good things and there are also some things I am not yet convinced of. Um, first off, uh, I'm not going to fault it for crashing. It does crash quite a bit, but, um, obviously it's still a beta, so that doesn't factor into my, yeah. uh, considerations. Um, the, the thing that's the most impressive is actually the pencil. I don't use it a lot, uh, but it's a Gen 1 pencil, and I could feel a little bit of latency in the previous version. With this one, honestly, it's like drawing literally on paper. I don't feel the latency at all. And this Gen 1 is slower than Gen 2 with the new uh, uh, right, iPads. Right. So I'm guessing it's it's mind-blowing, on, or maybe it's just the same because I don't feel the latency anyway now. Um, and uh, so that's a really cool one. A surprising thing is the Memojis are actually pretty fun. And the stickers <laughs> that put them in different positions. And essentially, they make um, they make emoji positions and faces out of your Memoji. And that's quite fun. Very personalized. It kind of uh, uh, solved the issue of having different types and, you know, inclusiveness and all of that. Well, doesn't matter. You have your own and you can make whatever you want with it. So that's pretty cool. Um, one thing which I'm a little bit unsatisfied with is the multitasking works pretty well, but the gestures, you know, copy, uh, cut and paste, it, when you have, you want to use it, I'm using it on a 10.5 inch uh, iPad Pro. Um, if you have two apps open at the same time and you want to cut and paste stuff, it's probably you're also going to have the keyboard in there. And that le leaves very little real estate for you to do those gestures. So I might get used to it, but for now, it's a little bit finicky. Um, and also, the swipe keyboard doesn't work on the full keyboard, it feels like. It works mm -hmm. when you you make it tiny, which is great. But I haven't, I don't think I've managed to make it work on the small one, on the big one. Maybe that's a bug, or maybe I don't yeah, know no, how to do it. But, thing, right? Yeah, but overall, a pretty cool not as, it, as awesome as I hoped it would be, though. Well, uh, once once the, the quirks are worked out, uh, we, we want to hear if you've replaced your laptop with it. Let, let us know. Uh, I can answer now. I haven't. Not yet. No, All right, let's, I, let's, I let's check out the mailbag. T. Fillingham in Discord, uh, T.L. Fillingham in Discord said, I laughed a week or so ago when no one could think of a good use for the 292-inch Samsung display. As soon as I heard it, I immediately said, that's a video wall. Think of every power plant control room you've ever seen in a movie. These days, many utilities use large screen installations for situational awareness where everyone in the room can see if something's going wrong. These routinely run hundreds of thousands of dollars. The 100,000 hour rating is roughly 11 years of continuous use. That's a little low for these things, but hopefully that will improve. And then Alan from the cornfields of Southern Illinois, near to my home, says, rarely do I get to share my podcast with my wife, but she's a 30 plus year stylist and I wanted her take. 
the basic supplies, hair dye, foil, and such would be a real boon. Easy to make a list and just order. Of course, we're talking about Amazon getting into direct to business hair supplies, stylus supplies, barber supplies. The fads, i.e. shampoos, conditioner, and such they get from suppliers might be a little more problematic. Stylists make their living on chemicals, not on haircuts and styles. That being said, my wife and the rest of the shop are flocking to Amazon. She wanted me to mention that we are rural and 30 minutes away from a crappy beauty supply store and an hour away from a less crappy beauty supply store. So this is a big deal for her. Thank you, Alan. And thank you, Patrick Beja. What you got going on to tell people about today? Uh, I guess a couple of things. First, if you speak French um, and you want to listen to a French explanation of Libra and you haven't had enough, uh, we did a full report with uh, a couple of experts, Uriel Ohayon and uh, Fabrice Croiseau on Le Rendez-vous Tech. So go check that out if you're interested. If you're into video games, Pixels just came out uh, a few days ago, um, yesterday actually, and we talk about E3 and a bunch of things that happened there. If you can't wait for MVGB, which is coming soon, uh, go check out Pixels. It's also a show and that one is in English. So, Folks, if you want to help keep us independent, you need to back us on Patreon. We give you some perks for it. Uh, our commercial free RSS feed, all kinds of stuff. Our goal every month is to get one more patron than last month. And here we are six days, five days away from the end of the month. Uh, and we need 14 patrons to push us over. So if you've been out there on the fence or maybe you left us for a while and you're like, ah, you know what? Maybe I should come back. Now's the time. A dollar a month. That's a nickel a day. If you can afford a nickel a day to help us out, it'll help us get to our goal at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. Bye. information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Simon Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>